So recently I've become slightly obsessed with The Dark Crystal, a fantasy puppet series created by Jim Henson, more specifically the Netflix show The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, a 10 episode series directed by professional French guy Lou Leterrier that premiered in August of 2019 and a show that I think was genuinely fantastic. Everything from the puppetry to the production to the writing to the celebrity voice cast, everything was just excellent, just spot on. And all in all, while there were only a few creative decisions that I didn't really agree with, it was a great show that I think was a loving, passionate tribute to the Dark Crystal film, Jim Henson as a person, what he created, dark retro fantasy stories that we don't get much of anymore, while also proving that all of these remakes, sequels, and reboots of properties from the 1980s and 90s don't have to be complete garbage. Especially since I wasn't necessarily looking forward to this. I mean, I knew what the Dark Crystal was, I hadn't seen it, and I didn't, I didn't really care about it, even though I'm like a fan of the Muppets really which makes it even better because this was completely unexpected you know taking something old and making it new for a new audience and the show set itself up to continue on from this point at the end of the season to something even more grand and spectacular leading into the film but that's the thing there's not going to be another season on September 21st after months of fan speculation it had been announced that the show was officially canceled by Netflix. This news coming out literally the day after it had won an Emmy for Best Children's Program. I mean, sure, it was a tie, but it was a BS tie. And that's, that's besides the point. This was the best news that the Dark Crystal fandom had gotten in months. All of it to seemingly mean nothing. The show was not coming back, and through the fan outrage and general disappointment, I decided to make this video, and I decided to wait as long as I did to make this video for a specific reason, because I was waiting for something, and what I was waiting for, I'll explain a little bit later. I wanted to know why the show was treated by Netflix the way it was, what had happened between the Jim Henson Company and Netflix, and why the show was treated the way it was, and why it ended the way it did, considering that it ended on a massive cliffhanger with a lot of unanswered questions. Questions like, how does everyone die? What happens to Dee? What happens to Hup? I mean, they just left him in the desert there all by himself. What happened to Rek here? Where did the Wanderer and the Heretic go? I mean, they were in one scene and then the next scene they were just gone. What's up with Deed's darkening vision? Where's Agra's son? What happens to the darkening? Does it just disappear? I swear, they literally never bring it up in the movie. How do they get back to the castle? Why did the crystal shard fail? How does Agra get the shard and then lose it? Why is Ergo blue? Where are the Skeksis that were in the movie but not in the show? Was everyone just gonna forgive Celadon after what she did? How did the Gelfling get genocided? How does the scientist make more Gartham? What are the mystics doing? Oh, wait. I already know the answer. Nothing. Who made that wall? And most importantly, how does everyone get genocided? These questions and a lot more aren't going to be answered through a movie or a TV show for the foreseeable future, unfortunately, and I don't know the answers myself. And I really wanted to clear up a lot of misconceptions that fans had about the show being canceled and what it means and the production behind it and answer the question of what happened to the best of my ability. This video is gonna be semi-scripted, unscripted. I have a list of bullet points here with every single thing that I could possibly think of to explain why the show was canceled. Uh, so let's get started. Now, before I get started with everything else, I sort of wanted to bring up two Two points that I kept seeing over and over again that unfortunately are not true and aren't the reason why the show had gotten canceled. The first one being that the show wasn't woke enough. Now what this means is that people have been saying that the show wasn't woke because it couldn't really push the sort of sort of politics of diversity and inclusion, left-leaning politics that Netflix is known for pushing in almost everything that they make. I don't think this is true because if you look at it from a certain perspective, the, the show does have a lot of sort of political stuff in it, but Thankfully, the showrunners were smart enough to sort of put that in the background as to not alienate people, and it would distract from the story, which is the main point of the show in the first place, other than the puppetry. And if you really wanted to, you can sort of see that the show is diverse and inclusive as it is. I mean, look at the, the voice cast. The show is smart with its diversity because it's not really the main, again, as I said earlier, it's not the main point of the show. You can just sort of forget that it's there in the first place and just enjoy it for what it is. Like the show is inclusive and that's just the way it is. And this also extends to the story as well. I mean, there are a lot of female characters and they're great female characters and they have a lot of major roles within the story and within the show. And it's not distracting it's not like oh look at us we have females look at the feminism it's the most feminist thing of all time well i mean outside of the documentary but that's besides the point anyways male and female characters in the show have major roles and they're on equal footing and it's well written enough that it doesn't matter that's just the way it is i just don't think you can get any more diverse and inclusive with this show apart from what they've already done already and thankfully it's well done enough that it doesn't matter and that's the way it should be the second point is one that I really don't want to talk about, but I don't think it can hide for much longer, and that is... <sighs> cuties. 
yeah, we all know about this horrible disaster. Um, talking about it makes me feel like a pedophile, so I'm not going to talk about it for long. Um, but basically, the cuties controversy happened. Dark Crystal got canceled like a month later, and so it was still fresh in people's minds. So a lot of people, a lot of people were like, so Netflix can cancel this amazing show, but they can keep like this like child pornography from France. And while I agree that the f the fact that this got put on this on Netflix in general is disgusting. This is, this, I think that this thing is absolutely disgusting and shameful and possibly illegal and just, just vile and should not exist. The thing is that Netflix did not make Cuties. They bought the rights to it when it came out, when it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, because another thing is that Netflix wants award prestige. They're really into that. They've gotten into that hardcore recently. Like, remember um, that movie Marriage Story and Martin Scorsese's The Irishman? They really like stuff that gets them awards. They also like being woke and they like showing diversity and, and inclusion and everything. And Netflix bought the rights, the distribution rights to Cuties, probably for really cheap, expecting it to get a lot of awards and for people to like see it as this like critical darling <laughs> that they could do something stupid like win like Oscars with or something. But it didn't work and it's more than likely near child pornography and again this has no right to exist and netflix is completely degenerate and completely stupid for even picking it up in the first place i'm and like a lot of people i'm upset that they would rather keep something like this than dark crystal but i feel like the deal was made picking up this movie way before the dark crystal was canceled or maybe it happened at the same time and they just sort of did it because netflix is gonna netflix they thought they were gonna get awards or something and they thought they could pitch it as maybe sort of female empowerment but it's more or less a really god-awful film that shouldn't exist but i do not think that the dark crystal was canceled specifically so they could release this film i think that it was canceled probably far earlier than even what we realized but not announced up until september of this year i'll explain this later but overall i don't think that twerking 11 year olds got this puppet show canceled even though both should not have happened and i'm not defending cuties either i think it's just despicable but yeah that's I don't think that's a really a main reason as to why it got canceled. It just happened and it happened the same time that this other thing happened. Okay, so now here are some red flags that I feel like should have clued people into the fact that the show wasn't going to get renewed relatively quickly. First one being no announcement of a season two before the show came out. Now, generally, if you follow Netflix and the way they sort of do things, they will announce a show. The show will get a release date. It'll get released on the platform and Either before then, during, or a little bit after the release, the show will get announced for a season two. And usually Netflix will literally green light a second season to anything. And this should have been the major factor that clued in the fans that the show was not getting picked up for another season. Just Netflix not say anything before the show came out, after it came out, a few weeks later, a few months later, a year later and so on and so forth. This also extends to the cast and crew because there was no real news or answers about a season two from anyone involved. This includes the showrunners, the writer, the director, just everybody involved with production, also the voice actors. Nobody said anything. Everybody was just dead silent. Before the show came out, they said that they had about four to five seasons worth of stuff planned and they were just waiting for a phone call with that green light from Netflix. Another point was that there were mixed messages from everyone. There was no real yes or no announcement. It was just, well, I mean, I mean, we want to. I mean, we, we like we have stuff. I mean, we're just waiting for a phone call with Netflix. And, you know, when Netflix of all people, Netflix of all people says that we'll call you in response to getting a green light, there's a huge problem. And this went on for months. I'm really um, impressed by the sort of Dark Crystal fandom's patience with this stuff because, like me, I just sort of... Like, after getting into the show, thankfully I, I had gotten into the show somewhat late, like only, a f like, I'd say a few months ago before I became, like, a huge fan of it because I love it. And even then, I was like, you know, it's kind of crazy that Netflix would wait, like, almost a year to not say anything. But then I realized it wasn't almost a year. It was an entire year because I thought that the show was released in, like, winter, like, November or December of last year. But no, it was released in August. There was just radio silence from everybody involved for over a year. But yet, the Dark Crystal fan base, not bashing you guys or anything, but they just sort of accepted it, kept up the hope, and just sort of assumed that there was going to be more to this. 
And I feel like the showrunners did as well. They just sort of assumed that there was going to be more of the show, but there was nothing. Eventually over time, well, this is another point, but everybody involved with the show just kind of moved on. This includes the showrunners, um, the director, Louis Leterrier. It came out that he was announced to be the director of, of all things Bright 2 for Netflix bright too i'm dead serious they're making a bright too they will literally agree on anything so yeah louis leterrier is working on bright too for netflix the main writers jeffrey addis and will matthews moved on they started their own production company there's no name or anything there's no idea what they're gonna be working on hey i mean maybe they could be working on like more dark crystal stuff i don't know lisa henson the ceo and president of the jim henson company and daughter of jim henson never really gave a clear answer about whether the show had been canceled or not or what was next she was just sort of like uh i mean we have stuff planned but we're just sort of waiting and like we'll let you know and uh well, I'm sort of going back and forth didn't really inspire confidence in the show coming back either and now the well, Jim Henson company at large is working on well actually a few projects yeah the people involved the Jim Henson people involved the puppeteers and all the people involved in production are definitely definitely busy but like, that's the main thing is that they were not waiting around for a season two announcement like everybody involved just kind of moved on because they have like rent or, or like a mortgage, maybe, bills, and they have to find work. And if there's no opportunities here for this, you just have to move on. I mean, it's a business, it's a job. And that's something that people seem to disregard is that at the end of the day, this is a business and the whole point is to make money. It also doesn't help that Brian Henson, the son of Jim Henson, said that they were not actively pursuing a second season weeks before the official cancellation announcement by Netflix. I mean, if they want a second season, we'll help make one. If not, then... That's it. The point is that from what I could see, the people involved were not losing sleep over the show being canceled. They just had to move on and go on to other things. This also leads into the celebrity voice actors that they hired, basically not saying anything either. Barely did any press outside of like a handful of them, which is crazy considering how many famous people are in this show, but they uh, didn't say anything either. The last major red flag from what I could see was that they took the movie off of Netflix. This makes no sense and is completely ridiculous for a variety of reasons. The main one being that the movie is the ending to the entire story. If you're a newcomer and you want to know what happened to the land of Thra and the Skeksis and the Gelfling and the crystal of truth and does it get healed or not and what happens, you have to watch the movie because it's the ending to everything. And the fact that they just took it off is just ridiculous to me. The movie was made and distributed in 1982 by Universal and they still have the rights to the film. Jim Henson has the rights to the IP of the Dark Crystal, which is how they got the show made in the first place. And they had the movie up on Netflix for a long time, for a pretty decent amount of time from what I could tell. So if you wanna watch the grand finale, the ending to this entire story, tough luck, too bad. As far as most new fans know, the show just kind of ends on a cliffhanger and then everybody dies. That's it. I guess Universal's gonna put this on Peacock or something, if they care enough to. I mean, if not, then there's gonna be no options for streaming available. And when you put it all together, you know that things were not looking too good and there probably was not gonna be a season two. And, uh, Hollywood does not really care if a show is good or not, just whether it makes money. Not to say that a show has never been kept on the air because of people that are involved with it, love it so much and they wanna see it keep going and they put their own money into it because they love it so much. It generally does not happen. Like a show needs to make money to keep going. And this leads into one of my main points about why I think the show was canceled and simply put the show was just too expensive to make now netflix hasn't really given us a budget for how much the show has cost i mean they never do I was looking at the show like the way it is and the level of quality production on screen it was not cheap it had to have been pretty expensive like i'm thinking around like hollywood blockbuster expensive like i'd say 100 million maybe a little bit more realistic 120 125 150 million yeah, like that high. I recall somewhere that Leterrier, Louis Leterrier said that this was like the biggest budget that he'd ever worked with, which I mean, if you consider that he's made films like Marvel's Incredible Hulk movie and The Clash of the Titans, that had to have been a pretty big budget. Like this was not cheap. And it doesn't look or feel cheap either. Like there isn't a single episode where you watch it and you're like, oh, that's the cheap one. That's the one where they just cheaped out because they had no money and they did it to get it done or whatever. Like, no, like everything is like consistent quality throughout the entire thing, which is very impressive, especially for a 10 hour show like this. Now, something that most people don't know is that production for the show took years. I mean, outside of the show itself, the Jim Henson Company has been developing this idea of a Dark Crystal revival for almost 
10 years. It started with a sequel film that never got off the ground that actually involved like Genny Tartakovsky, like the guy who created Samurai Jack. Eventually it turned into a prequel and then it turned into a TV show and then it got greenlit by Netflix and turned into what we have today. And then you get into the pre-production, which again took years. They were building puppets and sets. I think it was like 89 sets and like a few hundred puppets or so. And that's like even before the show started shooting. They started shooting and they had to sort of rush to get things done on time because it was a TV show. It wasn't a two hour film or an hour and a half film like the original movie. Sets and puppets were being built and rebuilt around the clock the day of shooting. They were writing and rewriting scenes and entire characters the entire time. It was just crazy. And it's even crazy when you consider just again just how good the show is. Also the fact that the show had the longest shoot schedule of any Netflix show in their entire history. Like Netflix was going all out with this show. Like they had a lot of confidence that this thing was gonna just kill it. I mean, they were right, but at the same time, I can't really see the show making its money back. I mean, sure, it's an artistic achievement and all that, but considering how much it must have cost, there's just no way. Something else that I didn't know was that the show was pitched originally to be completely CGI, um, just full animation because it would be more cost effective. Like it would probably be easier for people to sort of handle like first like when you're watching it at all. Then they were going to do like CGI Gelfling and then like puppets, Skeksis, and then eventually Netflix comes along. They're interested and they're like, yeah, but you know what? Maybe you should make them all puppets. Like make it like the like the original movie. So yeah, Netflix was the one that really wanted this to be an all out puppet show because the people involved, the heads of Netflix, were fans of the movie. And on the subject of cost, that leads me to my next point. Fans, when they first heard about the show being canceled, were really angry. And they heard that the show was too expensive. And a lot of people couldn't understand this. And I've heard this a lot, this argument a lot, that the puppets and the sets are already made so they should not have to make more for another season. And this is unfortunately completely untrue. I don't want to be the um Ashley guy, but no, unfortunately they can't use the puppets from this first season for another season if they made another season. Um, and that's mostly due to the fact of how they're made. The puppets, from what I can understand, are made from foam and latex. And these materials degrade and deteriorate over time. Perfect example, just look at the puppets from the movie. And sure, those puppets, considering how old they are, the fact that they're still around in general is a miracle, but good lord. You wanna know what happens to like the foam latex? It turns into this. I mean, look at his face. Like, oh my god. You know, actually thinking about it, like the Skeksis actually look pretty good for their age. I mean, them falling apart kind of works, actually. <laughs> That's besides the point. The point is that they cannot use the puppets from season one of Age of Resistance on a second season because the material will degrade over time. And apparently the showrunners have said this multiple times but I can't find a specific example from any of them in particular about it. But I was able to find this quote from an admin on the uh, Stan Winston website forum. Um, if you know Stan Winston, he was one of the best practical special effects guys in the industry. And this guy's an admin for his website, so he definitely knows what he's talking about, just has to. And to quote this guy, Chris, the challenge here is that there is no set time limit as the causes of foam latex degradation are variable. How the foam degrades is based on exposure to UV light, cold, heat, oils, moisture, movement. So basically the thing being made caused it to degrade. And keeping these pieces forever, which I mean, they're not trying to keep them forever, trying to keep them to use them to shoot with is not entirely possible as foam latex uses organic latex that breaks down naturally. So yeah, these things were falling apart as they were being made and as they were finished. And you have to consider like, if you watch the show, you'll realize that these puppets are being beaten up, thrown around, flying around, just getting just beat up the entire time and they actually hired people specifically to fix up these puppets in between takes because they just get ripped up that much and even disregarding that after the show is done this also involves the sets as well after the show is done props the puppets especially the sets this is the main point is that the sets are dismantled and a majority of them are just completely thrown away. The sets aren't already built. When they're done shooting, they're gone because keeping them up is a gigantic waste of space and money. And if these sets aren't being used, then what's the point of keeping them up? That's the way every movie does it. And speaking of post-production, on top of that probably being extremely expensive for all the CGI that they had to use, these puppets 
aren't being used. So they're probably just sitting in boxes. So you might, for example, have Rian. He might look okay. Like some of the Skeksis might still be okay as well. But then you might have like Deet and Brea are falling apart. This piece is broken. You have to fix it. By that point, you might as well just make a whole new puppet. If you have a costume in a movie, you're going to want to make new ones if you have the money. Like a lot of the times it's about like whether it makes sense to keep using the old stuff instead of making new stuff. And depending on what it is, you're going to want to make new stuff because it'll look better. On the topic of production, I think Burnout might have been a serious issue as well. Louis Leterrier directed all 10 episodes did all by himself. That doesn't happen very often. That's a major achievement, man. Like, like you deserve it. But did people seriously expect him to just do it again? Did they expect everybody else involved to just sort of do this again? Because this first season was actually cut down. It was pitched to Netflix as like a longer storyline, but they came back to them and they said, yeah, we like it, but cut it in half and that's your season one. And they made it and it was a lot of crazy hard work. And I, I'm not going to doubt that they'd ever want to do it. I mean, if they had the opportunity, I think they would make more, obviously. But realistically, like, that amount of work is going to cost maybe the same amount of money. It's not going to get any smaller. The scale, I think, was only going to get bigger, especially when they, especially with the introduction of like the Gartham, and now it's going to be an all-out war. Production wasn't going to get any smaller. It was just going to get bigger. The stakes were going to get higher. It was going to get more grandiose, more epic. And that was going to take even more work. And I don't know if they were actually going to be up for it. Realistically, part of me doesn't feel like they anticipated how much work this was going to be in and of itself this first season. They were like rushing to meet deadlines with things, but it just so happened to work out. And sure, another season might have possibly been more efficient, but it still would have been a lot. And I think it would have taken a lot of time to get it right. A lot of effort, a lot of patience, and I don't think that Netflix just had that patience anymore. The actors. As I said before, this show has an all-star, all-star, comparatively, a pretty big voice cast of named celebrities. And people sort of speculated that them being in the show was a huge cost. And while it's not something to disregard, from what I understand, from like reading interviews and stuff and watching interviews with the showrunners, a lot of these people did the show because they were genuinely passionate about the material. They loved The Dark Crystal, they loved Jim Henson, and they wanted to do the show. And simply put, they just wanted to do it because they just loved it so much. The actors didn't work for their regular pay. They took a pay cut to be in the show and the work wasn't as intensive. It was about like a week or two weeks, a week and a half worth of recording in a studio for them like around the world. They could just do it anywhere, just around the world. It came out in an interview with Gugu and the Raw, the voice of Celadon, that she only signed up for one season. And this is strange because for shows, like any shows, they sign a contract for multiple seasons. And if the show does well, they keep doing it. If the show gets canceled, they are let out of that contract and it's null and void, doesn't mean anything anymore. She only signed on for one season. Because if you watch the show, Gugu and Bathora's character, Celadon, her arc was clearly, un in my opinion, was clearly unfinished by the end of the series. And there was more to the character. And she's assumed that this was a one and done sort of thing which is very strange and also i remember jason isaac saying the same thing that he thought of this as a one and done sort of thing even the actors weren't too weren't too sure of this show's future as they were making it which is kind of sad but it does establish that they did not expect this to last long at all most of them barely did interviews for it they barely brought it up and then there's the issue the biggest issue of the entire year coronavirus COVID-19. I think this was a genuine factor in the show not getting renewed because unlike a lot of uh, productions, The Dark Crystal is different because it's a, it's a puppet show. And if you, again, if you watch the documentary and the, sort of go into how the show is made, puppeteers and the puppeteering, like there is no practical way that it's just impossible for them to practically make the show while socially distant, the way they are mandated, it's just not possible. The puppeteers are basically on top of each other the entire time. If I recall correctly, uh, a Gelfling is two people minimum. Skeksis is two people minimum. Two people right beside each other in that costume. Like one main puppeteer and one assist. And there's just no way that you could just do it the exact same way in a pre-COVID world that they made the show doing it now. It would have to get shut down again immediately because it would spread because the people get infected with COVID and it's just it's just a mess. And Or at least for a while until this pandemic just sort of magically goes away. Sad to say you can't really make the show the same way in a post-COVID world in a post-pandemic world, it's just not going to be possible, at least not for the time being. The show was a passion project from everybody involved. As I said earlier, the, sh the passion just shines through. You can tell that they love this material, they care about it, and they wanted to do the best they possibly could. And they did the best that they possibly could. But passion projects very rarely make it through Hollywood, especially. They're more rare to come by specifically because of the fact that 
they might not make money and the show didn't make money. I remember there was an article not too long ago that was from a Netflix insider that was trending and it talked about how the main people involved with the show. Okay, so it was a Hollywood Reporter article that basically talked about the Netflix executives were basically kicked out and this show was considered by them to be an expensive disappointment. And I remember like a lot of people read this and were like sort of like shocked. How could they say this? Like the show is so great. This is just some random person. Who cares? Like, there's definitely gonna be season two, guys. Like, believe me, there's no way they wouldn't make an another season. I do kind of believe that they genuinely believe that this show was an expensive disappointment. It's sad to say, but that's just the way it is. And all in all, like, nobody was really betting on a season two. Um, there wasn't a season two, and they just sort of accepted it and moved on. And I remember interviews not too long ago with um, Jeffrey Addis and Will Matthews sort of talked about the way they worded everything. They were talked about how they were sort of implying that it wasn't gonna get another season. And they were glad that they were involved with the show the way that they were in any capacity. My next main point for why the show was canceled is that Netflix did not get the viewership with the show that they wanted. And it wasn't as popular as they wanted it to be, as popular as the fans thought it was. The show just isn't popular. It just wasn't popular. Firstly, the show is a TV show based on a cult 1980s movie that didn't do well when it came out. The Dark Crystal in 1982, it was made for like 20 something million dollars and, and only made around like 42 million. So it broke even, but that's it. Common criticisms of the film back then were that it was too dark, it was too scary for children, it was weird, it was very alienating, and I think that it didn't hit the emotional beats that Jim Henson and Frank Oz really wanted it to. Like it didn't grab the audience emotionally. Outside of like fear, this world being an insane sort of mood and atmosphere. I, I really liked the movie a lot. I love the show more. Yeah, I can sort of see why the film wasn't very successful and how it eventually over time, over the coming decades and the coming years, became a sort of cult classic that it is today. But at the time, Jim Henson wanted to push puppetry and do new things with it that nobody had seen before and tell new sorts of stories that didn't talk down to children. And unfortunately, it, it, it didn't work the way that he wanted it to. So knowing this, would it be any surprise that the show isn't as popular as Game of Thrones or something? Like, it's niche. That's, like, to quote... Cheryl Henson, the daughter of Jim Henson herself, The Dark Crystal was never mainstream. It was just sort of this weird thing that you just sort of knew about and you, you'd bring it up and people would be like, oh yeah. And they sort of like nod their head and just sort of think about it and be like, yeah, that is definitely a thing that exists. Definitely. That is a thing. And the fact that this show got greenlit in the first place is just kind of baffling outside of the fact that it's an 80s property. Take out the word cult. If you take out the word cult, it's just an 80s movie. It's a cult movie. It's probably not the best idea to do on something, to, to try to make money with something that's so unpopular. Even then, I feel like this was kind of a hard sell. Part of me feels like people don't really like puppets the way that they think they do. And especially, I think that the Gelfling in particular are a hard sell. The Skeksis are fine. People love the Skeksis. Um, and they're fine. They're weird, but they're, they're fine. But the Gelfling in particular, they're just, they hit a sort of point where I wouldn't say Uncanny Valley, but I would say that it doesn't like work for people and they look weird. And I mean, me personally, I don't really care at this point. I mean, they are weird, but you get used to it after a certain amount of time, but that's the point, a certain amount of time. You stop caring because they're not puppets. They're characters and the characters are compelling and you care about them. It takes that time. You have to get invested into this world and I feel like most people sort of watched the first episode because they heard it was good, looked at the Gelfling, said, no thanks and they just just sort of dropped it because they didn't think it was interesting enough and the narration at the beginning of the first episode is kind of confusing and the, the first episode is not really like the best I mean, it's got some great moments but it's not it's kind of a sort of an awkward way to put people into this new world it takes a while for the show to hit its stride and really become fantastic and it also doesn't help that I think that most people think that puppets are for kids because when they think of puppets they think like first thing that comes to my mind is like Sesame Street and like the Muppets and those are aimed at like kids. Like most adults are gonna think that they're t it's too immature for them. But at the same time, they're gonna see what happens and see that it's this stuff is like horrifying. This is some really intense stuff. It's really weird and it's scary, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Like, that's the entire point. It does weird things to people like, <laughs> <laughs> that emotion is what sticks with people after all this time. That's why the, sh the movie is a cult classic and that's why the show is so good. 
fans have also speculated about if the show were to be picked up by another streaming service, like who would want it, who would want to pick up Age of Resistance if they could. And I think the main problem is that nobody wants it. And even if they wanted it, they can't really have it. In interviews, like Lisa Henson and some of the other producers talked about how they pitched the show to a whole bunch of people. They pitched it to Cartoon Network. They pitched it to The Hub, major movie studios, but nobody wanted it. And I feel like that still is sort of the case now. I mean, knowing how great the show is now, like, because there was no show, but even knowing how great the show is now, I feel like streaming services like Amazon or Hulu or Disney Plus or HBO Max, or whatever, would be hes- would be hesitant to pick it up just because they know how expensive it is and the fact that they already went to them, they already went to these major studios, streaming and cable, but in the end, Netflix was the one to pick it up on top of making it a full-out puppet show. People really, for some reason, want Disney to have it. Like, holy crap, that is, like, the worst decision imaginable. And that's because, one, like, it doesn't, tonally, it has, like, nothing to do with Disney. Like, Disney would just completely murder this show. You have to understand that the time, like, in the time of the original Dark Crystal film, Jim Henson quickly bought back the rights to the Dark Crystal from Universal. Like, not the movie, but the rights to the, like, the IP. And that's the only reason why we have this show today, because Jim Henson was smart enough to buy the rights back and to keep it. And now it's the main thing that the Jim Henson company has. And they actually tried to uh, sort of turn it into a sort of multimedia franchise, starting with the books by J.M. Lee. I think that's the author's name. And then they had books, they had comics, they had a video game merchandise, which stuff that exists is kind of getting up there in price, which is really annoying. Like those statues, those what is statues, like holy crap, like I just go on a tangent about those things. You have to take it alone to buy those things. It's ridiculous. Anyways, the Jim Henson Company wanted the Dark Crystal to be their big multimedia franchise. And unfortunately, it it didn't work. But thankfully, they own the rights to it because Jim Henson was smart. Like personally... I don't think that anybody would want to pick the show up. It's not impossible. Like, if you really want to get the fans on your side, you'd be smart to sort of pick it up and continue it in some sort of way. But I I don't see it happening, honestly. And now, speaking of streaming, Netflix. Netflix sucks. I'm not on Netflix's payroll. I don't care. I hate, I generally, I do not like Netflix. In fact, I'd say that I hate Netflix for a variety of reasons, like and how they choose shows by literally throwing crap at the wall and seeing what sticks and their obsession with pushing political ideology. Um, but I wanted to talk about how Netflix gauges viewership and a show's success. Well, Netflix doesn't release their numbers for their shows. They're not obligated to. We have to sort of go on what Netflix themselves says. Netflix is all about picking up new viewership. They gauge a show's success by whether or not they manage to pick up new viewers, new subscribers, and they sort of use that to gauge whether or not a show is successful or not. Honestly, I'm not sure how many people they seriously expected to pick up Netflix just to watch The Dark Crystal. Like, that's just unrealistic, and I feel like they knew that. They went to the show knowing that it was a passion project and that it was a cult movie and that it more than likely was not going to be, like, a huge success, but yet they spent $100 million plus on it anyways. It was a risk, And I'm glad. That's the one thing, actually, that I'm glad that Netflix does. Netflix takes risks. They're stupid risks a lot of the times, but they are risks nonetheless. They are willing to pick up projects that nobody else will. And sometimes you get you get stuff like The Dark Crystal and um, another show that I liked, um, Maniac by uh, Kerry Fukunaga. That was a really great show. They're willing to take risks. And that's the one thing that I appreciate. Or they were willing to take risks. Now it seems like they're going to pick up things that are cheaper because... They value, they want numbers, they want TV shows, they want movies, a lot of it. Quantity over quality. Whether the content is good or not doesn't matter because people are going to watch it anyways or not. Maybe, I don't know, but they want a lot of stuff and they push a lot of stuff whether it's good or not. And that's why a lot of Netflix originals, they're just trash. They're, they're bad. They're, they're garbage because they don't care because they need the content, especially since the big studios, Disney, Warner Brothers, Universal are taking their content off and putting it on their own streaming services, which is another reason why Netflix is going down the drain. They reported a subscriber drop off third quarter 2020 because there's nothing to watch outside of like a handful of originals. And right now, Netflix is prioritizing new viewers internationally, which this show might have been a hard sell because of that as well. But yeah, Netflix is run by dumb people. They need shows like Stranger Things that might eventually become huge hits that they just get lucky with, bring in new viewers and subscribers, and to make the money. But the thing is, even with that, Netflix is in a horrendous amount of debt. 
and they have been for a very long time and they're not going to pay off that debt and they're going to create more debt by picking up and putting money into things that are cheap garbage that just don't work. And you have to consider, do you want one expensive show that might be really good and people may or may not watch or do you want a bunch of cheap movies and shows that people are more than likely going to want to watch? Sadly, Dark Crystal is that expensive show that people didn't watch. Was the show well marketed? Well, that depends on who you ask. Depending on who you ask, certain fans will say, certain people will say, well, I had no idea the show existed, but other ones will be like, I saw a billboard outside of like New York or like outside of like in New York City or something. And Netflix did promote the show. They spent a lot of money promoting it, I would say. They went to Comic Con, I think. They played the first episode there. They had some of the voice actors come out. I feel like the marketing could have been stronger. The show's weird, but I think the fact that it's puppetry is even weirder. On top of it being a hard sell because it's puppetry, how many really successful fantasy franchises are there that aren't Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings? Trying to explain the plot makes most people sound like they're completely insane. And as I said before, it's niche. It's hard to get into. It's weird. But when you get into it, it's wonderful. And and I guess Netflix thought it was best, even though they were the ones that asked for an expensive puppet show, they probably thought it was best to just cut it off right here. And they probably saw the sort of treatment that they were given by the showrunners and they said, you want to do what? You want to have how many puppets? You want to do, I don't know, other things to consider. Who owns Age of Resistance? Now, this is an important question because, well, it's the show. Who owns the rights to the show is extremely important. From what I was able to piece together, the Jim Henson Company owns the Dark Crystal IP and Netflix owns the show. This could potentially mean characters, situations, like the episodes themselves. This is important because if the Henson Company wanted to like do a revival and I, I would say at this point, I'd give it like 10 years. The rights might be an issue because they'd have to find a way to sort of get the rights to these characters and these situations back from Netflix. And Netflix is notoriously stingy with stuff like that. Then when they get a property, when they get a show, whatever, they generally, they generally keep a hold of it. Well, they want to keep hold of it forever because it's theirs. Which is another reason why I'm glad they didn't pitch this to Disney and I'm glad Disney doesn't have this because Disney would do the same thing. Think about how they treated the Muppets. Netflix will probably want to hold on to this forever. They're not just going to give up the rights easily. If they wanted to continue it as like a show or a comic book, they'd have to, the worst case scenario would be that they'd have to change names around, redo the story in a certain way that's different. If they don't have the rights to write the show, then what's the point of continuing on this story? And it really sucks too because everything apparently was planned out and I keep joking about the genocide I'm joking about the genocide I never thought I'd actually do that like they were going to continue the story in a way that people weren't going to expect like Lisa Henson wanted to continue this and she wanted to fight for it but at this point she's like they're they have other priorities I feel especially since this one season already got made we also need to consider that we don't know when the people involved with the show were told that it was canceled and I'm interested in this because figuring that out would make the timelines make a lot more sense. For example, if they were told early on, that means that they hid it, they hid this information, pretended like the show still had a shot for almost an entire, for over a year. But if they found out later, like the fans did, then that makes it completely different because that means that they were on some level hoping that it would come back and planned on it coming back and it, it might've taken them by surprise as well. They probably, like, I, I wanna know like when they were sat down and told, yeah, this show's not coming back. Because they were giving interviews up until like a certain point about like the future of the show. And ag again, as I mentioned earlier, they were being really wishy-washy about it and weren't giving a straight answer. But if they didn't know, then that makes everything completely different. But I don't find this as likely because they probably were negotiating this for a long time and probably negotiated it like after the show was done. And I think the the phone call thing is the most likely most likely option. Like they were expecting a phone call, they didn't get one, and they just sort of collectively agreed that the show was canceled, but didn't want to bring it up. Mostly for the Emmys, Netflix and the Henson Company and everybody else waited to cancel the show because it won an Emmy. They were probably told not to say anything until the Emmys this year because it might have won and it did win, and decided to wait until the Emmy 
to officially cancel the show, which is unbelievably scummy. That is some scumbag stuff right there. It doesn't matter because on paper to Netflix, they consider it a miniseries. The showrunners were not allowed to, they weren't given the, the opportunity to at least end the show on their own terms, which is just, which I, I can't stand that. Like that's the thing about Netflix is that if you watch a show, you know, you have to sort of go in assuming that things gonna get canceled. If a show makes it past a certain point, they have to pay the people involved. They have to pay people on the production more money. Like if the show makes it to, I think, a season two, then they have to pay them more money. They don't want to do that because they're cheap, sporadically cheap. And what that means is that due to union rules that they don't want to follow, that the shows end, even if they're not really supposed to end yet, they just write them off as unsuccessful and move on and just throw more crap at the screen. And I hate this. So yeah, The Dark Crystal was canceled because Netflix is stupid. They asked for an expensive show based on a niche property and was surprised when they got an expensive show based on a niche property. And if this speculatory article is to be believed from this Netflix insider, after the show, well, didn't do very well, they threw all the main executives under the bus, just completely cleaned house. So what's next for The Dark Crystal? At this point, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Lisa Hansen has talked about how she wanted to continue the story in some way, shape, or form for a while now. And I feel like comics are the most effective or cost-effective way to do it. Now, at the very beginning of this video, I talked about how I waited to make this video for something... Um, in particular to happen. And that was that the showrunners, um, Louis, like Leterrier, Addison Matthews, were on a podcast called the Trial by Stone podcast, which is a Dark Crystal podcast. Yes, an entire podcast related to the Dark Crystal. Yeah, I found out they were going to be on this podcast and it was really informative. I really enjoyed it. Um, and they talked about like the making of the show and like the sort of thought process behind like the writing and stuff like that. It was very informative. I waited because I thought that they were going to talk about the cancellation. And unfortunately, they really didn't. They brought it up at the very end, but they tried to keep the mood, like the sort of the sort of uh, emotion sort of positive, which I mean, I can I can respect that. I mean, I can I can understand that because it's, it kind of sucks when you spend all this time working on something and it just gets canceled. Specifically, I waited for this podcast because I sort of wanted a sense of closure. And actually, Jeffrey Addis said the same thing in the podcast. Um, he said that he came on to do it because he sort of wanted a sense of closure to all of this. Answers that we were denied thanks to Netflix deciding to get rid of the show as unceremoniously as they did because... I mean, let's be real, they did not care about the Dark Crystal, like, past a certain point. It was only those executives, because they make a point of this, like, in the documentary to say that the executives that greenlit the show were the ones that cared about it, and when they got kicked out, nobody cared, and they just cut it off right there. Here, co like, here comes along The Age of Resistance, a show made by fans who understand it, who understand how to write a good story, who understand how to write good characters, how what made the original movie so special in the first place, and why people loved it, and what it does for people. The fact that this show was made the way it was, when it was, is all the more miraculous, because this was not guaranteed. And I guess on some level, like, you have to sort of be appreciative to Netflix because they greenlit in the first place because at that time they were willing to take a risk. Since the show's not coming back and it's not going to be a major puppet show ever again, like, there's, nobody's going to do this ever again, which is unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Like, people don't care about puppets the same way they used to anymore. People don't care about these practical effects the same way anymore. It's just sort of a dying medium. I'm glad that this show happened. Like, I think the quote is, like, don't be sad that it's over, smile because it happened, or whatever. Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, this video took way longer than I thought it would to make, and hopefully you liked it, you learned something, and hopefully you enjoyed it. And I want to give a special shout out to, and I hope I'm saying this name right, this username right, Armpit of New York. I assume the NY stands for New York, so Armpit of New York on Reddit. They found a lot of really informative interviews with the cast and creators of the show that I used for this video, and without them, this video might not have even gotten made. So yeah, thank you for the help. I really appreciate it. I'm Zero Knight. Thank you for watching. So just check back in five to ten years, I'll have made a video about this wonderful series, discussing everything about it, because I have a lot to, I feel like I have a lot to say. It will ironically become a cult classic in ten years.